Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Ideas are like opinions. <laughs> Everybody has one, right? But it takes a lot of energy and effort and resources to turn an idea into reality. So by you connecting with the right people, by talking about it, you will automatically attract, you know, there's the law of attraction and all that. The right people will hear it and go, wow, I can help you do that. Let me, or I can connect you to somebody who can do that. Let's do this. And so that's what happens there. So mindset, super important. First step of the business authorities formula, you need to get it right. And once you have that vision, you become unstoppable. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with buyer's agent Kitty Parker and strategy and innovation expert Rita McGrath, then check them out after you've listened to today's conversation, of course. I'm really excited to have today on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Johan Neguera of Business Authorities. Johan has spent his entire career solving problems and fixing businesses. He discovered the power of systemization and leverage in his early 20s, where he built his first e-commerce business. This knowledge allowed him to grow not only his business, but his clients as well. One of his latest businesses has reached a valuation of eight figures in just two and a half years. Johan has significantly increased the bottom lines of over a thousand clients in more than 40 industries worldwide. He does this with a focus on technology and on utilizing the systems he has built over the last two decades. In our discussion today, Johan talked to me about the importance of selecting the right people to work with. He explained how to build an empire by asking, what else can I acquire that serves my dream clients? And he explained how you can win by sharing your ideas. Without further ado, then let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Johan Nuguera. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast today from just near where I am in Melbourne, Australia, Johan Neguera, who's a tech investor. He's an empire builder. He's a business mentor and founder at Business Authorities. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Johan. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Fabian Patel, who was our guest on episode 308 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Johan, and introduced us. So big hello to Fabian. Massive hello. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've got an interesting story. You started basically an eBay store when you were still a student, I think. And um, yeah, now you've got six businesses that employ over 100 people and you running a $20 million empire, as you call it, um, and all of that in just over four years, I think. So I'm really keen to explore the lessons of that journey a little bit more. Um, but yeah, give us a bit of a whistle stop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I, of, of what happened there. I, I wish it was four years. It was, um, it's actually 16 years. So 2004, oh, right. when, I, when, I, when I started my, my first business, which is the eBay business, and I was doing my PhD at Melbourne University and Department of Primary Industries, and we were doing a joint venture there. And basically, I was an agricultural scientist. 
And I was doing my PhD when, and then I realized, hang on a second, the PhD is never going to get me to where I want to go in life. And my purpose in life was to empower people and to, you know, help as many people as I could while I have, you know, time on this planet. And we all know that our time on this planet is very short. So I built this little eBay business because finances, I was getting a financial education at that point in time. And I realized that, you know, finances play a huge role in way, helping you create an impact in the world. And if I was just going to go get a job, that was never going to allow me to create the impact that I wanted. So I built this little eBay business, this little eBay business that more, you know, that made more money than most of the people in my, at the top of their fields. And so at a very young age, I got pretty much financially free and I built six of these stores and my mother runs, runs the business now. And that business has not been touched in 14 years. It's literally been a set and forget type system. And eBay's evolved, but, you know, there's just been little tweaks and things. But I, I've had no involvement in that since 2008. So she's been running those. Um, got into affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing is where you sell other people's products and you take a commission on every sale. So um, we did that. We used to do it for the likes of Ticketmaster, et cetera. So every time a concert came out, we would do the advertising for them. And when a ticket got sold, we would get a clip of the ticket. Ha <laughs> ha, no pun intended. And so after that, two years after that, CPA marketing involved, which was cost per acquisition. So every time a lead was generated, we would get paid. Now the players in this, we used to do it for the bank. So if you, you know, Commonwealth Bank would put up a, um, into a CPA network, they'd put up a listing saying, we're looking for people to get other people to sign up to our credit card. And here's all the marketing material, here's the links, here's everything. So we could then grab that material and go and advertise it according to the rules that they set. And so if you went to Google and typed in Commonwealth Bank credit card application, my ad would be there at the top. And it would be, you know, cost me $6 a click, for example, but we'd get paid $200 a click uh, uh, form fill out. So again, it was just more arbitrage. And now this business continued and I was sitting there and I was all happy and I, you know, you get, you get sucked into, oh, what, which campaign can I set up next? And, you know, just yeah. the one campaign that I'm talking about, it had 1800 searches every month. So we were generating a very sizable, decent income from it and the business was growing. So. I decided to build a real business because people were like, oh, I don't understand all this internet stuff. So now this is 2010. So we built a business called My Alliance and still runs to this day. And that's the one which has those 100 people in there. Um, My Alliance became, uh, we started off building websites. And, you know, our first websites where we were building were for $500. Now we build websites that are $50,000. So it's a completely different space that we play in. But we ended up building stuff for, you know, um, airport security systems, the agriculture sector, different platforms, the defense force, that kind of stuff. So lots of fun, exciting projects that we got to work on. We got to, we became known as the people who like to do the projects that are, and nobody else wants to touch because they're a bit hard. Hmm. Um, so about five years ago, I sort of didn't lose passion for it, but I was tired of just being in that game and built a software company. Now that software company has got a whole story in itself. And that's the one which we took from zero to 20 million in four years. Um, that journey was just so exciting. And well, so what that company does is we build mobile apps for buildings and for estates. So any new developments that are coming up, if you look around the landscape in Melbourne, you'll see all these towers coming up, they run our software. So um, that company, while we're enjoying this amazing ride, I, I called up, well, I didn't call up, I got a call and I found out that two of my friends had taken their lives, which really messed with me because they were business owners and they did that because they didn't know how to get out of the situation that they were in. We're talking, you know, taxes, and they lost some major projects and they were just feeling very alone and like there was no, they were helpless. And so I started calling up some of my other friends because while I was doing what I was doing, I sort of, you know, I was just focused, you know, the horse with the blinkers on, just focused on one thing. So I started calling up all my other friends who were in the business world. And this is now like 2000, about 2017. And they were all going through a lot of loneliness, a lot of, you know, they didn't know how to grow their business. They got stuck that some of them had been running businesses for 10 years and they were just plateaued. They didn't want to grow anymore because there was pain associated with growth, all this stuff. And they said, how the hell did you achieve what you achieved? And that business that I told you has gone from zero to 20 million. That's headed to 100 million in the next eight years. 
So because of the way it's set up, it's got the right foundations. And so, and this pandemic, of course, nobody could predict that. So maybe it's 10 years or 12 years. I don't, I don't know, but you know, the, tra the trajectory is upwards. Hmm. Um, so that's why we built business authorities. Now business authorities was built by business owners for business owners to provide that support mechanism, but have rather than having these gurus who are on stage, you know, who are trained to pitch you stuff. It's people who are experts of what they do because it takes a team to build a business. And so we get those people to come and teach the people in our group how they've done what they've done. So whether you're a branding expert or scaling expert or automation expert or sales expert like Fabian is, he's freaking amazing. You know, we actually, it was a year ago yesterday, I me and Fabian ran a, um, and a full day event on sales and marketing and it popped up on our facebook and i was like hey look it's been a year can you believe it it's crazy. <laughs> um so yeah so it's yeah so that's how business authorities evolved and then from business authorities we built another business called earthlink alliance now i i know you said give us a short little thing but we're, we're nearly there <laughs> in in october, <laughs> in october last year um one of our, so back to my lines, one of the people that my lines served. So my lines has 36 agencies that send that, com that company work every day. And those agencies are, we're a white label agency. So we build everything for them and they put their names on it. So one of the people who we used to supply, he said, oh, my, I called him up. I said, you've stopped ordering from us. What's going on over here? Do you not like us anymore? He said, no, no, it's not that my business partner is terminal. And so I'm just running around like a headless chook trying to get everything done. And I can't go and generate new business. I said, what are you going to do with your business? He said, I'm going to shut it down. And he's been in business for 20 years. I said, what are you going to do after you shut it down? He said, I'm going to try and get a job. I go, I'm sorry to tell you, but you are completely unemployable because if you've had your own <laughs> business for 20 years, you can't, yeah. <laughs> you can't go into an employer. <laughs> and so he said, I, he said, I don't know what options I have. I said, how about I buy the business from you? Because we've been supplying them for all these years. We know the numbers. And so we buy the business and then we merge it. And then he ended up becoming an owner in that business. Um, so from that, my and Earthlink Alliance as well, um, it specializes in four things, the automation, marketing automation, platform builds, business strategy, and building mobile apps. In between, just before COVID hit, you know, we turned that into a seven-figure business in a very short span of time because we knew exactly what we wanted to achieve. And we did that using the things that we teach in business authorities. So that's a little bit of history around, around you know, 16 years of history and how many minutes did I go for? Eight minutes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> two yeah. two, well, two years a minute. Fascinating journey. And it, I think there's a one thing there that stands out for me is a bit of a pattern of growing businesses. And you talked about your eBay store initially that now runs itself and your mum's kind of <laughs> keeping an eye on it. Um, so... So I'm guessing you kind of developed a system that everything was systemized and you had processes in place and and probably lots of automation. How, how did you how did you sort of go about setting that up to start with and then replicating it? Yeah, for sure. So if we want to talk about back then, I realized that if I had to keep I had to keep doing the same things every day. And you know, with eBay, it's you're providing a product, people are asking you questions all the time. And then when you're shipping it out, you're letting them know where it is. Now, it's not like we have amazing tracking these days. I'm talking 2004. So I'd say, mm. hey, just dropped it off at the post office. You should have it in five days. And then after five days, hey, did you get it? If you did, please leave us a feedback. This was all manual, yeah. right? <laughs> Everything is automated <laughs> these days. So basically, I've made all those into templates. And so anytime somebody ordered, you know, this is the email that they would get, cut and paste, cut and paste. Literally in one or two hours, the work was done for the whole day and it was just incredible. So that sort of that systemizing brain, um, that's, that's allowed me to accelerate and systemize all these businesses. And that's once a business is systemized, it can grow really quickly. And as long as it has the right foundations. Hmm. Hmm. So that's okay. And um, I've grown all my businesses. Yeah. All right. Now you say your your plan is on impacting one billion lives. So what? what um, you know, tell us about that vision and what what are you, some of the things you're doing? Because I'm guessing that all these businesses are uh, feed into that. Oh, for sure. Um, so with 
with business authorities. In its first year, we impacted the lives of 1,080,000 people. And we track that using business, uh, B1G1. So if anybody doesn't know what B1G1 is, B1G1 is created by Masami Sato and Paul Dunn. It is a platform which allows its full transparency. So any money that you, you can choose which cause you want to donate to, and 100% of the money goes to those people. It's not like some other charities where you know there's admin fees and things. We pay the admin fees. So, for example, if anyone comes to any of our events, every time we have a cause, so in, you know, in March it was the bushfires, etc. So anybody who came, all the money was donated back to the bushfire uh, appeal, and it's fully tracked, and that would count as one impact. In November, you know, we we supported the Ukrainian families who were cold, and we provided shelter for them and, and clothing. So every person who came to our event, that money would then give those people clothing and shelter for the entire winter. So that's one impact. Now in one year, if a small, tiny little business like ours can generate 1,080,000 impacts in the world, 1 billion people should not be that far off if we all band together. And so hmm. from by using technology, by leveraging technology, we can actually have a greater influence on that. So I'll give you an example. When COVID hit, I reached out to our community, to the business authorities community. I said, hey, guys, look, COVID's here, and we've got an idea for a contact tracing app. Now, this is not the government's contact tracing app, because that was a big issue muzzle. But, <laughs> you know, but, hmm. So we built this app, and it took 10 days. It took 30 people banding together, working 18 hours a day to build this thing in 10 days. We were getting ready to launch it. And just as we were about to launch it, we, we pretty much got a cease and desist from the government saying, you can't launch yours, we're going to launch ours. I said, well, we, the government, you know, the world needs this right now. We're going to launch. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Anyway, we ended up collaborating with them, and but they didn't, at the end of the day, they just, they did what they did. And so we said, look, we've built this amazing technology. What else, who else needs this? Who can we give this to? And we found, you know, we're giving it to Bangladesh. It's rolling out right now to 160 million people. We're talking to South Africa. We're talking to um, Thailand and Vietnam, we're literally giving them this technology to help them with their COVID situation. So through technology, we can now reach many more people. You know, one, just one country implementing our tech, it's going to reach 160 million people. So therefore, in my lifespan, like that 1 billion number is by, by the end of my life, right? So I got at least another good 20 years <laughs> left in me. <laughs> and at the, at the rate of the, our acceleration, I'm pretty sure we will reach that. And it's not, it's not to do, I don't want people to know that I was the one who did it, but I just want to know that because I lived, their lives were impacted. That's it. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. And um, I've got visual here on, on your face. So I'd say 20 years, you're being very modest. I'd say you've probably got another 50 or so to, um, <laughs> on the planet. So, you know, maybe, maybe the billion is uh, a little bit, uh, Lowballing, <laughs> maybe up that to seven billion, I think, and then you cover everybody. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, Mr. Bill Gates has the same vision, but probably not the same yeah. intentions. <laughs> mm. All right. Um, yeah, well, I've lost my track now with the <laughs> little smart comment. <laughs> um, I I was going somewhere with the. Um, that's right. I um, you mentioned you know, giving away the app to Bangladesh and to South Africa. And then you mentioned supporting people impacted by, you know, harsh winter in the Ukraine and that might not have the resources to take care of themselves and shelter and whatnot. Uh, how, how do you get in touch with people there? How do you contact authorities there so that you can actually get those resources into the right places that okay. where they make a difference so that that's all done by b1g1 so if you just go to b1g1.com they've got they've got all that taken care of and so they've got mm. all the tracking mechanisms they all have they have all the connections to the right people then 100 percent of the funds go to them and everything is is transparent and that's what we love and paul dunn he comes to Melbourne, you know, I'm sorry, I say, hey, look, I'm having an event. Do you want to come down? And he jumps on a plane from Singapore and flies down here. His wife, you know, Masami, who had this vision and how it started off was she said, hey, look, there's these people who are buying TVs. What if every time somebody bought a TV, somebody in Africa or India or some other country got the gift of vision so that they, they could see? 
And that's how it all started. And then Paul is, mm. uh, is an amazing person. He said, actually, we could probably make this come true. And they've been going for 12 years now. So 12 years they've been doing this. And I think they've just hit over 210 million people that they've impacted around the world. And it's such, just such a great course. I love supporting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really great approach to um, you know, doing good with business. I think, you know, that's kind of fits in the whole philosophy of the human connection in business and because we all do business with people we know, like and trust, but we also like to feel as though we're helping others. So not and this is not just helping those people that we're giving or selling a product or a service to, but it's actually helping the wider community at the same time. For sure. And the and the beautiful thing mm. about it is you don't use it as a I don't say Jürgen, come to my event, and when you come to the event, the proceeds of it are donated to a Ukrainian family. It's actually after you've made the decision to come, you've paid and everything, a day or two later, you get an email going, hey, Jürgen, because you decided to come, we've actually donated that, and you've now clothed and fed a family in Ukraine for the next month. Thank you. And so it's not a, mm. don't use it as a selling point. It's not a carrot to yeah. come, like most charities, they say, 10% of our profits go to blah. And then you go, mm. well, in your brain, your brain automatically says, well, you've just added 10% on and you're charging me for it. And this is completely different. It's a different way of going about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. So you're basically selling the value of the event yeah. and people buy, buy the ticket because they believe there's value in coming along to the event and it's worth the money that they're paying for it. And then afterwards you say, actually, we've donated that money to a good exactly. cause. So thanks, thanks for helping. Yeah, hmm. exactly. A much better feeling. Love it. <laughs> All right. Now, tell us a little bit about the business authorities uh, formula, which I'm guessing is based on your experience of <laughs> growing all these businesses. And and I know you've got a 10-step framework there, and I'm a great lover of frameworks because yeah. it gives us kind of something to work within, and it gives us the creativity to actually, you know, style or adapt things to a Exactly. our own particular way of doing it yeah yeah and so you know this again comes from those 10 years of, well, probably 14, no, 15 years of experience building businesses and now i told you my first business it took blood sweat and tears to get it you know across the line imagine having 100 people there's the amount of grandmothers that die every day that, and we're like but didn't she die like last week now you've had three other ones die anyway we, it's crazy. When we deal with a lot of outsourced people, um, we have a lot of excuses and all this stuff. So <laughs> we were, <laughs> we were, I was thinking, okay, why did this business take so long to get off the ground and you know get profitable and get working and have be running by itself? Whereas other businesses that we built are so easy. Now, the one that I told you about, the software one, that, that was the turning point in my life because that's where I met these amazing people who said, hey, we want to build this business. This technology that you have, Johan, is amazing, but you don't actually see the value of what it's creating. And I went, oh, interesting. I go, you're here selling this tech, but you should be building it in this way to get to the valuation of 100 million. Now, this is 2000 and 2012 when this was first conceived, but 2015 when they used the word 100 million. Now, I had not pictured what 100 million look like i couldn't even i couldn't even imagine it because my brain was okay we've got these many staff this is how much money we're making and it was literally a hundred times you know let's say we're doing a million they said we're going to turn it into 100 million my brain went that's a hundred times more problems and we've got <laughs> we've got no problem <laughs> but they said we, we don't build businesses like you do and i was like oh wow and then they showed me their track record and one of the, the partners in there that the last company they built was $1.2 billion. Again, all these numbers sound so amazing. And they generally, well, they were to me when I was uh, in 2015. I was like, I cannot even comprehend what you're talking about. But then at the end of the day, we start realizing that they're just numbers and just a few extra zeros, et cetera. So how did we build this business from zero to 20 million in four years? And then how did we turn Earthlink Alliance from zero to a $7 million company in four months like it's 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 using this formula right so i'll give you the example of building interactive so building interactive is a software company so when we started doing our market research and going into the into the different um into our 
the real estate. There's so many different types of real estate out there. We could go after councils, hospitals, you know, uh, medical practices, townhouses, normal houses, buildings, and big, big estate developments. So we realized that the buildings, the new buildings that are going up, and the estates, the big estates, we're talking, you know, four or 500 lot estates, they would get the most amount of ROI from our technology. They would make money times 100 on what their investment was. So we said, why don't we just focus everything on these people? So the goal, so the first thing we identified was, what do we want this business to do? We want this business to be worth $100 million. That was our vision. Because now we, when you have a vision, every other decision that you make has to be questioned against that vision. Does this help us get to our vision? Is it going to help us get to that $100 million? So once we had that, then we decided on who are we going to serve? Who can we help that gets the most amount of value from what we do? So in my other company, we used to help everybody with a heartbeat, which is completely wrong. Mm. And, you know, <laughs> but when you first start a company, that's you just trying to help as many people as you can and you don't care. So we're very selective with who we work with. Why? Because we, we want to work with people who get a massive ROI, who value the work that we do and who see great returns. So that we decided it was the buildings, the new ones that were going up and the estates. Then we had to create a brand that would attract these people. So, you know, before I used to think, oh yeah, a brand is just, let's go on Fiverr and just get a brand done. We had to think about what is important to these people. Well, in the real estate industry, it's to do with being green, the green revolution, you know, having a building that's not, that's in the green part of the green revolution. Then we're living in these buildings, but they, it's, it's like a village. How could we turn it and make it interactive? So I lived in, in, you know, an amazing building in Melbourne. And when I moved in, they said it was the best building in Melbourne. And so I slowly realized, oh, there's a lot, we could create a lot of interactivity. So hence the name came Building Interactive. And then what was the mission of the, of the company? The mission was to create smart cities, one building at a time. So that became our tagline. Now, imagine if you are a real estate developer or a, a, you're building apartments and you get an a email or a letter or a pamphlet with something that says Building Interactive. Your brain goes, oh, I build buildings. This guy's going to make it interactive. And then at the tagline, it says creating smart cities, one building at a time. Your brain automatically says, I want to be part of that smart city revolution. I want to be part of this ecosystem. So just the brand was opening up doors for us without them reading anything, which was pretty cool. So in the brand, you get to, you got to realize that there's a lot of little nuances in there. So then once we had that, we had to build our presence. We had to build all of our marketing collateral and the marketing collateral was all focused on them. Like most companies talk about, about us, what we did. Hmm. Blah, blah, blah. Nobody gives a shit about what you did, to be honest. They just care about <laughs> the problem that you solve for them. So all of our collateral was around how we're going to make them money, how we're going to turn them into the hero, how we're going to showcase them as, you know, being this great, you know, developer that's doing all this amazing things for the community. So. With that, as our marketing material, we then automated everything. So as soon as an inquiry came through, six people get a notification going, this person is inquired, here's their data, here's their LinkedIn, this, 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 and they get all the data. So then whoever chooses to call that person, they've got all the details of exactly who they're talking to, the size of the potential business that we could close. So once that was done, once we did all the automation, now even when, now it's become, um, our, the business has become like ordering a pizza for these guys. So the start, our sales cycle was one year. The sales cycle is now three months. And in that three months, in the first meeting, we will get a promise from them saying, if this works in one of your buildings, we want the rest of the 15 or 20 other buildings that you have. They go, yes, for sure. You know, prove to us that this works and you will get this. Now we don't even need to prove anything because we've been in existence for so long. We can say, this is the, you know, these other buildings, they're using our tech. This is the case studies. And they go, well, sign us up, let's go. But it's become like ordering a pizza. So they call up, they go, we want an app and it has to have this, 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 this. We go, great, it'll be ready in two weeks. So again, this is all to do with automation. So that's the next step of the formula. After that comes sales. So I spoke about our sales cycle. We reduced it from a year to three months and we just, the sales techniques that we, we use in, the, in every presentation, again, it was focused around them, all about them. How can we get them the ROI? So at this point in time, now we're no longer working in the business because sales is finished. 
and sales is set up, not finished. We always sell it. After that, we went into scaling. How can we scale this business, not only in Melbourne, but nationally and internationally? So we had to have all the policies, procedures, systems set up so that we could replicate this, not just in our team, but any team around, the, around Australia or overseas. Once we had that, we had, and the next step is called amplification, amplify your tribe. And so now you're going to businesses that already have access to the databases and you, you do joint ventures, you do PR, you talk, you advertise in the right magazines and you're basically getting out, it out there. The step after that is called dominate your industry. Now, this was the most fun part because what we did was we went and found, <laughs> I, I love it. We went and found who else is servicing our clients. And in, in our industry, there's five other business, businesses that service those clients. Now, when you're building a building, as when, it, when it comes to software IT, there's five, com five types of services that you need in order for it to run. So we went and found the market leaders in all of those and said, hey, we are servicing these buildings. How would you like us to sell your product for you when we're selling ours? Hmm. Nobody said no to us. And so yeah. as soon as we got the partnership with the second one, then we went to the third one and went, hey, you know, we've got our services. We've got this other guy's services. We'd love for you to come on board. If you want to come on board, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine. But basically, you're turning our sales force into your sales force, and we want you to turn your sales force into our sales force. So we're complementary. You know, we're, we're not competitors. We're complementers. Great. Mm. So now we've got three. Then we've got four. Then we've got five. It was the easiest thing to do. Now, if anybody wants to come into our market, they're going to have to offer a product service the uh, product uh, service offering that's going to have the combined resources of five companies to compete against. It's massive. Mm. And, you know, so that's how we ended up dominating the industry. And then the last step of the formula, the business authorities formula, is building your empire. Now, empires are different to every person. In this company, what we ended up doing to build the empire was we bought up other software in other companies that had access to our ideal clients. So we started buying up software that runs schools, software that runs aged care facilities, that sort of thing, because we want to build apps and technology for those, for those other companies. Yeah. So that's how we ended up dominating the industry. Now, in my personal thing, yeah, building your empire, my empire is giving away, giving away as much as we can. And so empire means different things to different people. And anyone who said, you know, there's no point making all this money if you're not going to create an impact with it. You can't take it to the grave. So my purpose is to educate enough people. And anybody who says money doesn't make you happy has literally not given enough away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's, that's golden. Anybody that says money doesn't make you happy hasn't given, given enough away. So we'll... We'll definitely have that one as one of the featured quotes for this episode. Um, but there's so much to love in that whole process. I mean, I, you know, it sort of mirrors very much our own marketing process in the very early stages, particularly where you talk about, you know, identifying who the dream client is, making sure, you know, you focus all your energy and all your marketing, all your branding, all your messaging to that particular target market. Um, but I love the the tail end i mean that's magic the you know partnering with with other suppliers to that particular industry and basically locking everybody else out once you build that network of hey you know we come in here's our product but we also we also work with all these other people and so you know we can connect you up with the whole lot so it's you know, done for your service you know you put the building up and we'll deal with everything else for you Exactly. And, and likewise, the other the other businesses are doing that for you too. Love it. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Now, I want to circle back to something because I think this is sort of related to this and, and I'm guessing there was a lesson there. You, you said early on um, that one of your businesses um, is a website business that you started off building websites for $500 and now, you, now you're building $20,000 websites, I think it was. Um, how did you make that transition? Because I've been in, in communities where, you know, there's been lots of web developers and web designers or like coming at it from different a different perspective and, and you know, the conversations there around how do we elevate from $5,000, oh, sorry, 
um, projects to three thousand to five thousand to ten thousand dollar projects. So what what's what's some of your advice that you made that transition? Yeah, for sure. So it comes down to understanding the value of what you're creating. Um, I'll I'll I love to teach in stories, so I'll tell you a quick little story. Mm. There's in the in the U.S. I think it was the early 1800s or something of that sort. Yeah, when Henry Ford was first building his first trucks. So rail controlled all the transportation inside in America. Everything was done by rail. So there was four main companies that controlled the rail industry. And so they used to ship everything around. And then Henry Ford came along and he said, hey, I've got these things. They're called trucks. I've built 700 of these. Would you like to buy them? And they said, you're crazy. You know, we're, we're in the rail business. Trucks have nothing to do with the rail business. See you later. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, so they could literally have bought Henry Ford for pennies on the dollar. So what was the mistake? And now, you know, in this day and age, 80% of shipping is done via trucks and 20% is done via rail worldwide. And so it's a I don't know, $6 billion or $6 trillion. I can't remember the numbers. You can look it up. But it's a massive, massive industry. Then those four companies, they missed out on it. They could have divvied it up amongst themselves. Or one of them could have grabbed a monopoly. So the point there was those companies failed because they thought that they were in the rail business. Mm. Whereas if they had thought broader, they would have realized that they were in the transportation business. And it didn't matter what the vehicle was. It was the, if, that's, if that's the business they're in, that's what they should get into. Now, that's the, the rail one. The same thing happened with the ships. You know, in the early 1900s, when you know, the ships were becoming, they were building ships with massive hulls and you know, the Titanic and all that kind of things. They were focused on creating the most efficient ships, the ships, the lightweight ships, the cargo hulls, all this stuff. And then they thought they were in the shipping game. And then airplanes came around and the airplanes <laughs> took them out because a lot of the, they'd fly it over there much quicker than a ship would to cross the, the seas. So by thinking, so you asked me the question, how did we go from $500 websites to $50,000 websites? It was a shift in thinking. When we first started the company, we were building websites that were, here's your logo, here's the home about our services mm -hmm. and a contact button. And you could literally go on Theme Forest, buy a template for 75 bucks. It would take a day to configure it and you charge 500. It's like, wow, look at that. We made 500. We, were, we made $400 profit because, you know, a guy in the Philippines costs 20 bucks for the day and all that kind of stuff. So this is 2010. Um, but then the people would come back to us and go, hey, I've got my website, but I don't have any business. Nothing mm. changed. You didn't actually add any value to it. It's like, no, but now yeah. tell people you have a website. <laughs> okay, great. And what do I need next? Well, now you need Google ads because you need, if anybody's searching for your business, they need to see you on Google. And then you need a, you can pay for the ads or you can do SEO and then come up there. And then Google Maps came out so we can put you on Google Maps. How much is that going to cost me? Okay, cool. Well, you, the ads you pay for, there's a bidding auction system, blah, 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 blah. The maps, you do it once, you optimize it, or you could do SEO, which is ongoing monthly and you're competing against everybody else. So now we've got three other services that we can tack onto the website. But then when people come to the web, that's one way. And so that's hmm. search marketing. And then we talk about interruption marketing. Hey, you are selling, uh, let's say, dog leashes, right? I've got a uh, staffy sitting right here next to me. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm on Facebook and it says, treat your staffy well. You know, he needs the best chew toys. And here is a box with the chew toys, a little bit of a leash and some cute little thing. I go, oh, that's cool. So it interrupted my scrolling pattern. And now I'd be like, oh, I'm interested in that. Click. And then I'd go there and I might buy it. So interruption marketing. So now we're adding on another service. Hey, let's get more people. But we're interrupting them. They're not searching for you. Now they come to your website. What happens? Now we need them to understand what they want to buy. So how do we target market? So they need separate landing pages for each service. It's not, here's all of our services and they get lost. Mm. So then we had landing pages, then we had funnels come through, and then we had automation. And so that's how a website goes from $500 through to a $50,000 a year project. You know, And then there's some that are way more complicated and we build in bots and all this other stuff in the back end and admin panels and blah, 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 blah. But either way, that's how you pretty much go from a $500 website to a $50,000 website. But the sales pitches 
we guarantee you that by implementing ABCD and paying us the $50,000, we will give you $500,000 in return. Because at the end of the day, nobody cares about Google ads and Facebook ads and blah, blah, blah. They just care about if I'm going to give you this amount of money, how much money can I expect to get back? And so that's it. If you do the numbers, if the numbers work, that's all people actually care about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's so much gold in that. And it also comes back to what you were saying earlier in the two stories you told about, um, you know, and asking the question, what business are you really in? Yes. And, um, you know, I like... I like to reflect on that question a lot because in, in my very early days when I first came out of university and landed a job at ACFA um, in their film research division and I thought I'd uh, landed in heaven because I've been a hobby photographer ever since I can remember. In fact, I can't remember not taking photographs. It was sort of back three years when I was three years old, I started, started an interest in photography. So I thought, this is fabulous. And within a short space of time, you know, my timing was perfect. The digital revolution had kicked in for photography and um, and I witnessed firsthand on the inside the responses to that and I could never understand why, you know, why the management there and I'm sure that uh, Kodak, <laughs> the same thing was going on there, didn't understand that we weren't in the film business. We were... We're in the business of helping people capture memories in some form. Yeah. And there was another way to do it now that whilst the quality initially wasn't all that good, it was actually much more convenient, quicker, um, cheaper in the long run. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of benefits. Kodak, we can talk about Blockbuster. Blockbuster, why did they go out of mm. business? Most people say Netflix took them out, but it's actually convenience, late fees, you know, all those things. Um, Netflix created a great, there was, you know, I don't it, you know, well, I used to go to the movies and they'd say, don't pirate movies and all this stuff. But people mm. wanted convenience. They wanted to watch a movie in their convenient home theater. And then as soon as Netflix came, piracy actually dropped. Piracy dropped by 60% because Netflix came out because now people were too lazy to go in there and Just download. <laughs> they didn't want to download it. They didn't want to search and download it. And, and is my computer going to get a virus and all this? They just went straight to Netflix and they know for $17, $18 a month, they've got all access to all of it. Brilliant. So hmm. just one of the things you always have, your listeners always have to remember, what business am I really in? And, you know, health professionals, they're the same thing. If you go to them, they go, you need to do this exercise. And if they say, I'm a PT, I'm a personal trainer, it's, well, no, you're, you're a lifestyle peak performance coach. Because mm -hmm. by me doing the exercises that you're telling me, you're actually going to extend my life. You're going to give me a better quality of life. I'm going to be happier. My relationships are going to be better. I'm going to have more energy mm -hmm. for my kids. When you start thinking of it from that, you know, that's what you're actually giving me. Do I really mm. care about spending $60 or $80 an hour with you? No, like I will pay you $200 an hour to teach me all that stuff to make sure, because what's one hour of extra energy a day worth to me? You know, and so anyway, mm. we can go into all those sorts of yeah. things. But, and, yeah. and it opens up a whole lot of other opportunities, right? Because now you're saying, now it's not about giving you an exercise, a physical exercise that you do every day that will result in something. It's about how else can I help you Exactly. You know, be be better in your, you know, be more energetic. Uh, how else can I help you be fitter? How else can I help you be healthier and so that you live longer, so that your relationships are better, so that you, you're you more active at work, you contribute better at work. So, you know, then all of a sudden, hey, there's all these other opportunities. Yeah. And mm, this, I love it. This is why I love business. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about mindset because um, thinking of, yeah, t talk to us a little bit about mindset, the abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset, because I think the, you know, you talked about Netflix and the example that actually the pirated movies dropped down. And I'm guessing probably the same thing happened with Spotify and pirated music. <laughs> and, you know, people kind of think, well, if we do this, then, you know, that we're going to lose out like the film film producers or the production companies and the music production companies we're going to lose out because there's going to be more pirated stuff and people aren't going to buy the cds or the dvds and yet the opposite happens so well, how can we shift that mindset yeah for sure and 
mindset is 80% of success. And that's why mindset is our very first step in the business authorities formula. It's let's get your mind right, because when your mind is right and you know exactly what you want, you can get there much quicker. So again, I'll tell you another quick story. I have the privilege to spend time with some very, very wealthy individuals. And at the same time, I've had people from my past who are very poor in terms of their mindset. So I'll give you an example. I go up to a person, I'm like, hey, man, how's, how's things going? You know, what's, what's latest? What's exciting? Oh, I've got this great idea and it's going to change the world and I know it's going to be amazing. Okay, cool. You know, do you need any help? No, no, no. Johan, you've got a digital agency. You've got a tech company. I don't want to tell you just in case you steal my idea. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> obviously, you don't know me very well, but all right, cool. Hmm. You, know, you, you stick to your story. A year goes by. Come back. How's it going? You know, I, how'd that idea go? Did you make it happen? Oh, uh, you know what? I had kids and all this other stuff happened, but I'm going to do it this year. Okay, great. I'll see you. <laughs> Come back three years later. Uh, how do you, how'd you go? Oh, uh, Uber stole my idea. That was my idea. I was going to build Uber. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so that's, that's a poor person's mentality, right? Because they're, they're scarce. They don't want to, they don't want to share. They don't want to tell people their ideas because they think that people are going to steal their ideas. Well, in fact, all the wealthy people that I get to hang around with, they tell you every idea that they have. The reason they tell you every idea that they have is, hey, Johan, you know, I've got this great idea. I need, I'm going to build a contactless payment system that's going to be able to transfer money instantly between any countries without any fees or with minimal fees, much less than PayPal and blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I know exactly who can build the tech, who you can connect with, which government to, who wants to implement this in their country, all this kind of stuff. And just in that one, two minutes of conversation, we've now, I can introduce them to the right people and the, the thing will actually come to life, which actually that's a funny example because that's actually what's happening right now. So mm. the rich, my, the people who have a rich mindset, they will tell you all of the ideas because they know by talking about it more and more, they talk it into reality. They create the reality. This is what I want to achieve. Who can help me achieve it? It's not about... and. Ideas. Ideas are like opinions. <laughs> Everybody yeah. has one, right? But it takes a lot of energy and effort and resources to turn an idea into reality. So by you connecting with the right people, by talking about it, you will automatically attract. You know, there's the law of attraction and all that. The right people will hear it and go, wow, I can help you do that. Let me or I can connect you to somebody who can do that. Let's do this. And so that's what happens there. So mindset, super important. First step of the business authorities formula, you need to get it right. And once you have that vision, you become unstoppable. Hmm. Love it. That's fabulous. Well, this has been fabulous, Johan. I could go on for ages here. It's a really inspiring stuff, but I'm watching the clock a little bit because otherwise we get carried away and we'll be here all day. Um, so I think it's a good point to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some answers that will inspire our listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. For sure. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, business is innovation and marketing. So everything is about innovation and marketing that product out there. So all, all I see all, everywhere I walk is how can we innovate that? How can we turn that into a better product? How can we get that out there to more people? And so, um, yeah, in, innovation is life. Hmm. Hmm. And asking questions and being curious about how can we improve things. That's, yeah, that's yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Well, well, speak of, let, let me just give you another quick example. This guy in America, he saw people on skateboards. And so he, he saw them at the skate park and they were skating and, you know, grinding it on the ground and all this stuff. All he did was he put a little bit of flint at the tip of the skateboard. And so now when they gra did the, the grinding thing, sparks would fly out. Of course, they couldn't start a fire, but that became a craze and it went viral and everybody wanted one of these. And there was the, a stocking stuffer for Christmas. One little thing, that extra little part, I think cost him 20 cents, but he was selling it for 30 to 40% more than the normal skateboards. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> great example. Yeah, just a little idea. And then it highlights also what you're saying earlier about the mindset of, in terms of um, actually taking action on an idea. Yeah. Hmm. 
And he didn't need to, all, all he had to do was have the idea, but then what he did was he went and approached the skateboard um, company and said, I've got this idea, I want to license it to you. And he had all the licensing terms, et cetera. And so he gets royalties from that forever. He didn't even have to create the product. He sold yeah. the idea to them and then they've gone and created it. And now he's got an income stream that comes forever, which is amazing. Hmm. Love it. Okay, now what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Uh, I have new ideas all day, every day. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have I have a tech company. So basically I have, well, have you seen Minority Report? Yeah. Okay, so I watched that movie, I think back in like, I don't know, 2008 or 10. And one of my teams, they had just finished a major project and they had a break for a week and they said, okay, what are we doing? And I said, oh, actually, I've been touring around speaking everywhere. I haven't had time to go and get you guys a new project, but I saw this great movie called Minority Report and I'd love for when I walk past a billboard for it to scan my face, run it through the internet, understand who I am, and then present me with an ad. I said, can you build that? They go, yeah, sure, why not? And in a month, we had that built. And we started talking to, to these other companies going, hey, we've got this technology. Now anybody who walks past your shop is going to scan their face and go, hey, Johan, we know that you love leather shoes. You know, we've got a discount on leather shoes. Would you like to come in? And then after me, there's another person walking behind me, scans their face and it tells them what, you know, what they should buy based on their profile. So, yeah, innovation is, it's, I love it. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> right. Love the story. Yeah. All right. Now, what's a, a favorite resource of yours? My favorite resource would be people. I love talking to people. I love spending time with amazing and pretty much anyone I speak to is always amazing. And the ideas that people have, the background stories, the programming that people have put into their minds, because we are what we put into our minds, which is the programming, which is the mm. books that we read, the programs that we watch, and then discussing ideas. And then from those ideas, comes new innovations that we can use to help the world. Hey, Jürgen, what can we do to improve X? What can we be? <laughs> and we just, as you said, we could sit here and we could talk for hours and then and we'd come up with these amazing solutions which we could help change the world with. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a really powerful thing to keep in mind that um, having, and, and it's about having meaningful conversations with people. So I like to talk about having a meaningful conversation here rather than it's just an interview. And yeah. I think I've banned the use of the word interview from all our <laughs> material now that we send out for the podcast. And um, that's twice I've used it now, so I'll stop using it forever now. <laughs> um, but yeah, meaningful conversations. And I've been to some networking events recently that where They've really focused on that as well. And there's been some amazing outcomes for me, exactly from what you said, talking to other people, sharing ideas with them, and all of a sudden people saying, hey, I can help you implement that, or I can introduce you to somebody that, that knows how to do the technology or knows how to um, you know, do something that maybe you, you hadn't thought of before. And so that just generates a whole lot yeah. of momentum around it. At, at our last event, which was in March for the business authorities, we had this amazing lady, her name's Brenda Thompson, and um, she she got up and she told us a story. And the story was, imagine if you're in a networking situation and Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, and Walt Disney were there, and Ray Kroc and Walt Disney decided not to have a meaningful conversation they decided to try and do what most people do at networking events which is sell <laughs> and right yeah. they're going hey walt disney why don't you come to my you know burger joint and i'll give you half price burgers and walt disney says hey why don't you come watch one of my movies i'll give you a half price movie ticket which is generally what happens at networking events mm. instead they sat down now they didn't actually sit down their board sat down but they sat down and had a meaningful conversation and a meaningful conversation ended up in a joint venture, which changed the world. The joint venture was anytime you went to McDonald's, I think in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you would then get a voucher to go and watch the latest Disney movie as well as the toy, right? Hmm. And back then, the toys were actually really good toys. Now they're just... Yeah. <laughs> and then if you went to the movies, you'd get a voucher to go to McDonald's and get your free burger, or free fries, or whatever it was. That joint venture, they could complement each other. And all that comes from understanding the market, understanding how they could complement each other and having a really proper conversation, which can then lead to so much more. So I love meaningful conversations, just like yourself. Mm. 
Yeah, great. Love the example too. <laughs> All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a project on track? Keep a project on track. Again, people. <laughs> people, <laughs> expectations, and boundaries. So whenever we do any project, we outline the boundaries and the expectations right up front. We let the client know what to expect. We let we also let them know how we're going to be communicating with them, when we're going to be communicating with them. One of the, you know, in project work, one of the things that always, if, if you leave the client to their own devices to make up their own minds about what you are doing in the background, that leads to trouble. Hmm. Whereas if you say, this project is going to take five phases. In phase one, this is what we're going to be doing. This is the timeline. This is when we're going to contact you. And this is when we need your input. Boom. They know that there's a process in place. Most businesses don't have processes in place, don't have mm. diagrams in place. Uh, you know, they don't show people. Do we have time? I'll give you another quick little example. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So we go to this financial planner. This financial planner goes, Johan, we need to, and I grew up with this guy. He said, Johan, I need you to run Facebook ads for us. I need your company to run Facebook ads for us. I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We can do that. But we need to do an audit of the company. No, 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 no. I just want ads. Just run ads for me. I said, why do you need ads? He goes, I need more leads. I said, okay. But if you want to work with me, you've got to follow our process, which is we need to audit the company. Take it or leave it. <laughs> and he said, okay, okay, all right, fine. Let's do it. So we did this audit of his company, found out he had a database of 12,000 people who he had not talked to in three years. I said, <laughs> you don't need any more leads, my friend. They're already... Yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, yeah, but, you know, and their uh, insurances, key man insurance. So each client in that 12,000 database is worth between $5,000 to $25,000, right? So it's a significant database. So I said, give me this database, and I want to do a direct mail campaign for you, and we'll get those people calling your phones. And he says, direct mail? What? Isn't that from, like, the 80s and 90s? <laughs> I want the latest. I want Facebook ads. Go, just trust me. Give me 1,000 of these people, and let me just show you what happens. So we get this. <laughs> we get a, a, a database and 1,000 of these guys, and we send them a direct mail campaign. Now, what's a direct mail campaign? I want you to picture you are the client. You are the key man that we want to target. We want you to re reissue your insurance. I mean, insurance costs 25 grand. Now, you get an envelope, or the company pays for it anyway. You get an envelope, it's A4 piece of envelope, uh, a big yellow envelope. It's got confidential stamps across it. It's got your name handwritten on it, and it feels like there's something inside. And it's not just a book or something. You can feel like there's something else inside. And so this is called lumpy mail. So it piques your curiosity. You open it up, and then there's a, stick, a post it sticker on there saying, Jürgen, your insurance has gone beside the way of the dinosaurs. And it points an arrow to a plastic dinosaur that's attached to this thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the reaction we want. We want the person to laugh. And then they mm -hmm. read it and it goes, look, your, your thing's expired. We, you know, we really want you to, you should reconsider about getting your insurance renewed. Now, we usually have about a 3 to 5% engagement rate from that piece. A week later, the people who did not engage in that they get another one, and it's got a little magnifying glass, and it goes, read the bottom line. So again, same, yellow envelope, confidential, handwritten, it's lumpy, you can feel like there's something there, post-it note saying, use this magnifying glass to read the fine print. And in tiny fine print at the bottom, it says, we will help you increase or decrease your insurance costs by 20%, for example. And you read it, again, you get a laugh, and there's some funny articles in there about insurances and magnifying glass, and all these, all these things. Now, the third... The third week, if you still haven't taken action, by the way, as soon as you take action, you get removed from the database, you're put into a different, mm -hmm. so again, automation. The third week, you get another one, and it's got two little dice. So yellow envelope, confidential, handwritten, lumpy, there's two dice. Hey, are you gambling with your business's future? What would happen, Jürgen, if you were not there anymore? <laughs> You need to make sure that the business lives on, it's protected, blah, blah, blah. You're the key man. We need to ensure you. Let's get this going for your family. All that kind of stuff, right? By now, if you haven't taken action, the week after that, we, you get a big postcard and it says, we've been looking everywhere for you. Please tell us you're okay. We don't care about you signing up to any insurances. Just let us know that you're okay. By this point, you get a laugh. Now, you're either in, the inbound calls are at about 20%. So 20% of that 1,000 database are calling in, going, hey, book me in, blah, blah, blah. And the people who don't call up, we can have a follow-up follow system where somebody calls them and goes, did you get the dinosaur? Did you get the dice? Did you get the magnifying glass? Whatever it is. And they laugh. It's no longer a call. It's not, hello, Mr. Jürgen. I'd like to talk to you about blah, blah, blah. Right? 
hey, that's my best Indian accent. <laughs> <laughs> and so now it's not a cold call. It's a warm call. You've experienced it. You, you, you're like, wow, yeah, that was really cool. To talk to me about it. And so I called, this guy calls up two weeks later and he goes, Johan, what are you doing? Just shut it down. Shut it down. I said, what's wrong? He said, we're booked out for the next six months. We can't handle any more leads. I said, all right, cool. Let me one minute to have your Facebook ads. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to love about that story. And it's, um, you know, one of the things is that, you know, sometimes clients come and ask for something, but um, it's good to actually explore what is it that they really need. Yeah. Um, and you've, you know, clearly you chunked up there and said, well, why you want, why do you want Facebook ads? And it turns out we want more leads. Well, you know, there's a better way of getting more leads because you've got this huge database already. And the second thing, is and you know the next question is what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves and i think there's there's an answer in that already because you know going back to techniques that might be 1980s but putting the modern technology on top of them with using automation to be really smart but generate a human interaction is is clearly going to differentiate it because nobody else is doing that anymore because they're all doing facebook ads <laughs> exactly so what would you say is the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Well, again, I'm going to continue on the story from this same client, yeah. financial planner, right? So as we looked at their sales cycle. So now we're going through their business, we're doing the audit, and we realized that they were closing at a rate of 20%. So 20 out of every meeting, every 10 meetings, they're only getting two leads. They have, the cost for their service is between 3000 to $5,000. Their objections were it's too expensive and they're like but you don't understand you know this is actually going to help you it's for your future and so that was their frustration so i said okay there's a break between you guys are so energized about trying to help this person but the person doesn't want to take on the the service because it's too expensive i go tell me what happens what is the process and they said okay well first we sit down with them we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting which goes for an hour or two hours it's called a fact find meeting we understand where they're at in their life right now and where they want to go. Again, for digital agencies, et cetera, you can all adopt this same thing. For after that, what happens is the analyst goes back and writes up a statement of advice, understands of high, medium, and low, the, the three different risk strategies, and then writes it all up and says, these are the strategies that we recommend, and then takes it to the director of the business. The director of the business sits down with all the other directors while they discuss, hey, for Jürgen, you know, he's in his early 40s, and this is his investment strategy. Which one should he go? High, medium, low, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, and then they come back with, this is the final, this is what we think you should do. Based on all your circumstances, we think you should go with the medium risk, and this is why. That whole process that I've just described takes two weeks to accomplish with all the research, with understanding the three different strategies, with presenting it to the directors, the directors talking about it, then the directors putting their recommendations, and then them writing it all up, and then having another meeting to present it. Now... Their conversion rate went up to 8 oh, and they don't even have to pay it out of their own pocket. It's paid from their super. So there's no out-of-pocket expense. But they're going to get the strategy, which is going to, instead of ending up with 800000 they end up with $1.4 million you know, in their super or whatever it is. That's, that's the difference yeah, between the strategies. So by showing them a step-by-step -step process, their objections that were now coming back were, wait a minute, why is it so cheap? If you've spent two weeks on this, why is it only $2,000? And their conversions went to 80%. Mm -hmm. One simple tactic that was implemented in there. So now we've got this massive database, which we can mine at any time, plus an amazing system that we can put them through, which leads to high conversions. They did an extra $8 million in the next six months because of just those two things. Mm. Yeah, I love it. So... So streamlining the process. Well, apart from apart from you being very generous with my age, I, I love the tactics that you described. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, thanks, Johan. This has been absolutely fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you and um, maybe even reach out and say thanks for all that you've shared today? For sure. So you can jump on um, just businessauthorities.com. That's where I hang out. And if you go to Facebook, go to Facebook and type in business authorities community and join our community and 
yeah, I'm usually in that group and that's where I hang out. So I'd love to connect with you. Okay, and we'll post links to those in the show notes as well. Now, do you have some parting advice for the listener today? Yeah, there's opportunity no matter what the circumstances. And we're recording this right now during a pandemic. And just remember, during the Great Depression, it was the greatest transfer of wealth. So again, mindset, keep that positive mindset. Know that no matter what, life is going to go on. So how can you maximize all the opportunities that are being presented to you right now to build a better world? Hmm, great, I love it. And it, there's so much negative stuff going around in this pandemic and you know, there's people criticizing those taking action. And I always think of the Roosevelt quote, Theodore Roosevelt quote, and that uh, Brene Brown uses a lot. And I won't say it now because it's quite long, but it basically says, you know, if you're not in the arena, you shouldn't be criticizing. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. So it's good to have a positive, you know, love the positive mindset and say, hey, there's opportunities here. And I mean, you know, the, at a basic level, look at what Zoom have done. Look at um, all the all the services that are springing up that um, help people get better at doing business online or connecting with family online. You know, there's opportunities there everywhere because there's a whole set of new needs that we now have that we didn't have before or didn't know we have before. Fabulous. So finally, Johan, who else should I get on the podcast and why? Uh, do you want me to talk about that or do you want, I can email you a whole list of people. Let me, let me think about it and get back to you. Okay, great. Love it. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights and your stories. I loved all the stories with us today so generously. And, um, you know, I've really enjoyed this. There's been so much there to learn and I'm sure the listener will get a lot out of this today. So I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thank you. A pleasure. We'll talk soon. Bye. See you. I hope you enjoyed that insightful and informative conversation with Johan and took something away from his episode and our discussion. My takeaways, ideas are like opinions. Everybody has them, but it takes a lot of hard work to turn them into reality. So action and personal connection beats keeping the ideas to yourself for fear of someone stealing them. I'd love to know what you took away from Johan's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Johan Naguera. That is J-O-H-A-N-N-N-O-G-U-E-I-R-A. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Johan Naguera. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Johan, as well as links to the Business Authorities website, to his social media pages, and to the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast, where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including Chris Barras Brown of Upping Your Elvis and Neil Sahota, IBM master inventor and AI expert. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. 